If this is your first time playing a Dark Souls game, you'll notice there's not a whole lot of a tutorial at the beginning. The game's supposed to be vague, but it's kind of unfair for the game mechanics to be vague as well. For that reason, I wanted to make a tutorial to help new players get started. The notes found on the ground in the tutorial area really only show basic combat mechanics. This will get you through the first boss just fine, but you're going to need to learn a little bit more to get through the entire game. Dark Souls can't be played like your typical action RPG, where you just run up and start whacking the enemy till they die. You're going to have to play carefully and be observant if you want to survive. Whenever you discover a new enemy for the first time, you want to play defensively. As they try to hit you, you'll start to notice openings in their attack patterns. Once you learn these openings, you can start going for attacks when they leave themselves open. Sometimes their attacks even leave them vulnerable to backstabs. Once you really learn an enemy's attack patterns, getting the timing right on your parries becomes easy. And while it seems intimidating and for good reason, it's important to remember that even some large bosses can be parried and even reposted sometimes. If you can't get the repost off on a boss, don't worry because there's still a vulnerability when they're parried. You'll know for sure you're doing extra damage if you hear this sound. If an enemy's attacks deplete your stamina while you're blocking, your guard will be broken. However, most enemies can also have their guard broken. Kicking an enemy while their guard is up depletes more of their stamina than just attacking them. Some weapons also have block breakers as part of their weapon art. Those make it easier to break the guards of stronger enemies with more stamina. Once their guard is broken, they're vulnerable to critical hits just like they would be if you parried them. There's also several attacks you can do while maneuvering, some examples being the sprint attack or the dodge attack. Both are executed by doing a light attack after sprinting or dodging, respectively. If you do a heavy attack out of a sprint, you'll do a jump attack. The same move can also be done by tapping forward and heavy attack at the same time. Doing it like this requires less space but more skill. If you backstep instead of rolling, your character will do the sprint attack instead of the roll attack, which is better depends on the situation. The tutorial also doesn't tell you that you can charge up your heavy attacks. Once you're confident you know what an enemy is capable of, it's important to be aggressive when you're fighting it. Take advantage of every opening you see, especially on large enemies. If you keep the pressure on, it'll stun them. This lets you repost them as if you'd just parried or broken their guard. For most enemies, you initiate the critical at their head. You want to be careful not to use up all your stamina though. If you do and the enemy decides to attack you, you'll be unable to dodge. A lot of the stats seem pretty self-explanatory, but some of them have extra effects that aren't quite so obvious. For example, Vigor raises your maximum health, but it also increases your resistance to frostbite buildup. Some enemies will apply this effect whenever they hit you. When they do, a meter will start building up showing you your current frostbite level. When that meter fills up, you'll lose a large portion of health and have some of your resistances lowered. All status effects work a very similar way. Having higher resistance to his status effect makes that bar bigger so it takes longer to build up. Next we have Endurance, which typically governs how much stamina you have. However, it also reduces lightning damage taken and gives you some bleed resistance. When your bleed bar fills up, you're going to take massive damage and it can sneak up on you sometimes. Vitality raises your resistance to physical damage and also increases your equip load. If the weight of your equipped items is over 70% of your max equip load, you're going to get a slow roll. Making sure you have a fast roll is essential in combat. Dexterity is clearly the modifier for dexterity based weapons, but it'll also reduce fall damage and reduce the cast time of spells. The last of the primary stats, luck, governs how often items drop in your world. On top of that though, if you have a lot of luck and you use bleed or poison weapons, those poisons and bleeds are going to build up faster. It also gives you resistance to curses, which will insta-kill you if they build up all the way. And there are a few weapons in the game that actually scale with luck instead of dexterity or strength. The last and probably my favorite stat is poise. Having a lot of poise increases your resistance to staggering. If you get hit while you have low poise, they're going to knock you around a lot. If you get hit while you have high poise, you're going to have more freedom to act. The armors that have the best poise, however, are also usually the heaviest. There's a lot of different weapon types in Dark Souls and they all behave differently. The type of weapon you decide to pick is up to you. First, there's daggers. They have super low damage but really fast attack speed. Their speed, however, doesn't quite make up for the low damage they do. Instead, the strength of daggers is in critical hits. If your timing for parries and block breaks is spot on, then daggers are for you. 
because all daggers have an increased damage multiplier for critical hits. Next there's thrusting swords. These are all the rapiers in the game. Similarly to daggers, they have a high multiplier for critical attacks. The modifier is not as extreme as daggers though, and unlike daggers, its regular attacks are actually still worth using. Rapiers also have the ability to attack while the shield is still up. This allows for relatively risk-free attacks, but if you get hit while you're attacking, it still costs a lot of stamina. Straight swords are probably the most popular weapon type, probably because they're so versatile and easy to use. They don't have any special traits, but that's exactly what makes them good. They also generally have low stat requirements, so if you're looking for a weapon to supplement a caster build, straight swords are the best bet. They also generally come with the stance weapon art, which gives them a pretty easy way to break an enemy's guard. Curved swords behave similarly to straight swords, but they typically have a higher dexterity requirement, but also scale more with dexterity. However, this means that they will also have a lower base damage, making them only useful if you have enough dexterity. Attacks with curved swords typically appear more elegant or acrobatic. Additionally, instead of a kick attack, they have a quick escape that will deal a little bit of damage to your target as well. Gameplay-wise, katanas behave very similarly to curved swords. They also scale pretty heavily with dexterity, and most katanas also have a bleed effect. While the standard moveset for katanas looks cool, weapon art is what really separates katanas from curved swords. The katana weapon art is similar to stance from straight swords, except instead of a guard break, they have a parry attack. Axes and hammers both behave very much the same way. They usually come with the war cry weapon art, which increases attack damage for yourself and allies in the vicinity. Your war cry also changes your strong attack to an alternate version, which is usually more aggressive. The basic moveset for axes and maces is usually slower than swords, but deals a little bit more damage. Spears and pikes don't really seem to have any difference to them, so I'm just going to treat them all like spears for the sake of this video. Just like thrusting swords, spears have an attack they can use while you're blocking. However, since they have greater reach and less of a focus on critical attacks, this makes them ideal for a defensive build. Most often, the weapon art for spears is a high damaging charge attack. Halberds seem like they'd have a lot of similarities with spears, but they're actually more geared towards an offensive build. While the attacks appear similar, they can't do an attack from behind a shield. Like spears, they have a long reach. Halberds, however, have access to more wide sweeping attacks, which are great for multiple enemies. Moving into the heavier weapons, great swords are just a step above axes and hammers. Their attack is even slower, but it also deals even more damage. To make sure the enemy doesn't attack you in between hits though, it also deals more poise damage. Weapon art for great swords might vary, but they commonly have the stance weapon art. This is a Japanese game though, so you gotta have a class of weapons that are ridiculously oversized. Among these, ultra great swords are the fastest and most versatile. Naturally, these weapons require a lot of strength to use, but their attacks are absolutely devastating when they land. While they don't have quite as much reach as halberds, they have wide sweeping attacks as well, which are good for multiple enemies. The sheer weight behind your attacks means a charged heavy attack will often land enemies straight on their face. The weapon art for ultra great swords is usually a sweeping uppercut attack, which will also send enemies flying. Great axes and great hammers are almost identical to ultra great swords, except for the fact that great axes usually have the war cry weapon art, and great hammers usually have perseverance which increases your poise for a really short time. It falls off pretty quickly though so it's kinda useless if you use a shield. Moving on to the more exotic weapons, reapers are probably a little bit similar to halberds. Their attacks have a similar wide reach and arc. It's kinda hard to explain exactly what role exotic weapons fill. They each typically have a unique weapon art. Honestly though, as with most exotic weapons, I'd typically try to avoid using them unless you're going for style points. Other exotic weapons include whips, which have the longest range but also the lowest damage, and fist weapons, which have the shortest range but the fastest attack speed. If you want to dual wield, you can't just equip two weapons in either hand. Keep your eyes open for the special paired weapons you can find in the game. With these weapons equipped, instead of two handing, you'll pull out a second weapon. This makes special dual wielding attacks available if you attack with the left hand. Attacks with dual wielded weapons are typically more acrobatic and flashy than the regular counterparts. The first range weapon you're probably going to get your hands on is a bow. There's an unmentioned separation between short bows and long bows. If you want to use a bow as your main weapon, you want to make sure you're using a short bow. The reason being that short bows can do dodge and sprint attacks. They also have a weapon art that lets you shoot a lot of arrows really fast. Long bows, on the other hand, are better for getting the attention of enemies who are far away. Their weapon art lets them do high damage with a single shot. It takes a while to charge up though, which is why it's not as useful in combat. 
Crossbows serve a similar purpose to bows, but they're a little bit more versatile. That's because crossbows can be used with one hand. The game has two phases to firing a crossbow. First time hitting the attack button loads a bolt, and the second time fires it. This lets you ready a shot before a fight, and then fire it instantly once it starts. The weapon art is a shoulder tackle which lets you stun enemies who get too close to you. Unfortunately, the weapon art isn't very effective. A great bow is essentially a long bow on steroids. Strength requirements are usually pretty high for them, and you also have to stand still while shooting. They need special great arrows to fire, and getting a hit with them can be a little difficult because of the time it takes to knock each great arrow, and that you can't move while you're doing it. But if you do hit someone with a great bow, it's a guarantee that you're going to knock them flat on their asses. Especially if you hit them with the weapon art which it shares with longbows. Throwing knives aren't technically a weapon, but they deserve a special mention for being effective and easy to use. They don't have any staggering power, but they have no wind up and will throw instantly when you try to use them. This is great in PvP to get a ranged attack on players without them even expecting it. No matter what kind of spell you plan on using, it needs to be attuned at a bonfire. The number of spells you can attune depends on your attunement stat. There are also some rings that increase the number of attunement slots you have. You have to look carefully though because some spells will take up two attunement slots. Sorceries need to be cast with staves. Buffs and support abilities are currently sorcery's strength, since the damage of the offensive sorceries is kinda underwhelming. If you want damaging spells, you want to look at pyromancies. There's only one pyromancy flame in the game, but it has no stat requirements, so it allows you to use it with any class. Pyromancy has some buffing spells, but its biggest strength is high damage AoE attacks. Miracles are cast using talismans and chimes. The only difference between the two being the weapon art where chimes have a small heal and talismans have a poise boost. The biggest focus of miracles is healing and buffing spells for yourself and allies, but you also have access to some pretty strong damaging abilities. Small shields are lightweight but don't block a whole lot of damage. They're supposed to make up for this by having an easier parry, but it doesn't really work very well. As a result, you don't see a whole lot of people using small shields. If you still want to use small shields, you want to make sure you use it with an offensive build, since the shield itself won't provide a whole lot of protection. Regular shields are the most common and typically block 100% of physical damage. While some of them will parry, others will allow you to use your weapon out without two-handing your weapon. Great shields are characterized by high stat requirements and heavy weight, but also high protection and stability. Their damage is effective enough that they can be two-handed and used as a weapon on their own. In keeping with this theme, their weapon skill is a bash that won't lower your guard, allowing you to plow through enemies without getting scratched. When you get to Firelink Shrine, you'll start seeing messages left by other players. The usefulness of each message varies and you can disparage or applaud it as necessary. To leave these messages yourself, however, go to the menu bar and then bring up the messages menu. This brings up a pretty basic messaging system, but if you hit whatever button you have assigned for change note format at the bottom of the screen, this allows you to add conjunctions, an extra message, and even emotes to your message. Whatever emote you choose will show up as a little ghost on top of your message whenever anyone interacts with it. You can use this to direct other players up, down, or in different directions as needed. Or just make your messages sillier. Also, when you reach Firelink Shrine, you're gonna want to avoid spending all your souls leveling up. First, you want to visit this vendor for a couple important items. First is a white sign soapstone, which you can use to join other players' world and help them. Completing a boss in their world will reward you with embers. If you prefer to get your embers through PvP, go upstairs in Firelink Shrine and talk to this guy. He'll give you some consumable red eye orbs, which you can use to invade another player's world. Killing the host player will reward you with embers as well. If you keep checking on his location in Firelink, he'll also send you on a quest to get a permanent red eye orb. The next item you want to get is the torch. You'll come across a lot of dark areas in the game, but also the fire damage and some other aspects of the torch will come in handy later. If you equip the torch in the main hand, it's easier to use as a weapon as the fire damage is useful a lot of times. But if you equip it in the off hand, you can hold it up by hitting the block button to produce more light. If you have more than two friends you want to summon, you also want to get the dried finger. But I'd recommend not getting it unless you do have three friends you want to play with, because not only does it open you up to an extra invader like the item description says, but it also makes the bosses exponentially harder if you summon a third phantom. 
Prism stones are another item available at the vendor and have a unique use that you might miss if you don't read the description. If you throw them off a ledge, they'll make a short clinking noise when they hit the ground. This means the ledge is safe to jump off. If you hear this noise though, that means the drop is guaranteed to kill you. Sometimes the stones will glitch out though, so if you're ever skeptical make sure you throw a few prism stones down. If a single one makes a noise, don't jump. Every time you get invaded, you have a chance for a special item to spawn in Firelink Shrine. Because of this, any time that happens, you want to go up to this area in Firelink Shrine. Most of the time, it'll just be empty like this. Every once in a while, though, it'll drop a seed of a giant tree. Using this during an invasion will make enemies in your world attack the invader as well. You'll also see a key in the handmaiden's stock. It'll take you a while to get enough souls, but when you do have enough souls, you want to get it for sure. After you have the key, you want to go up to where the giant tree was, and there will be a locked door that you can now open with it. Go to the top of the tower, and then when you get to a bridge, you're going to want to jump off on the left side. From there, run to the center of the roof, where you'll see a bird's nest sitting on top. There's a large list of items you can trade at this nest, but what you want to trade first is the homeward bone. Just make sure you hit leave instead of discard. And when you exit out of the menu, the homeward bone will be replaced with a couple of items. The more important of the two being the call over gesture. This is important for interacting with other players as it's the only one that makes any noise. Yeah. When you kill a boss, you'll get a special soul. Hang on to that, as it's super important, because after you kill the curse rod of Greatwood, you'll get a transposing kiln. Take the kiln to Ludleth in Firelink Shrine. He'll use it to turn boss souls into special items for you. If a boss soul provides you with nothing you want, then you can eat it. I hope this tutorial was helpful for some people. Remember to take it slow, keep your eyes open, and remember the locations of any locked doors you find. Keep honing those skills, and you'll be surviving where everyone else fails around you.